Good evening. Welcome to the Grandma's Attic Music Review. What a joy it is to be with you tonight, and you're just going to have such a good time tonight. Tonight is a show like no other. I have tonight two world-renowned, let me just put it that way, musicians. Um, I have to tell you that you all know that I love classical music, and you know that I have my seasons passed to the Eastern Connecticut Symphony Orchestra and I try to attend every show. This year, I got to meet these two amazing, incredible musicians. Um, they're humbler than I'm being about this show, I just have to tell you, although they won't tell you that they're humble, they'll tell you just the opposite, but they're very humble about their music. Anyway, I met these two after they soloed or duoed for the Eastern Connecticut Symphony Orchestra. And then they, at the end, when there was a, a rousing standing ovation, they took us out with just another amazing rendition of, I think they might even play it today, I'm not sure, but I'm very excited to have Rita Porvir Porfiris, is that right? That's okay, right. and Anton Miller with us. They're wonderful musicians. They're gonna play stuff that you've never heard done on this show. Just enjoy, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show.
That was a duo by Bohuslav Martinu. Um, and Martinu was an established Czech composer. Um, he wrote that piece in the 1950s. Um, and he moved to Paris at the end of World War I, where he was exposed to the emerging trends of jazz. He remained there during World War II and became involved with the Czech resistance when the exiled Czech government set up in France and England. When he composed a musical tribute to the resistance, he was blacklisted in absentia by the Nazis. When the German army approached Paris in 1940, Martineau and his wife fled, eventually settling in the U.S. in 1941. He taught at the Manus College of Music for most of the period from 1948 until 1956. Um, he also taught at Princeton University and the Berkshire Music School, also known as Tanglewood. Um, and it was during that time period, uh, living in New York um, in the 1950s, that he taught the iconic American songsmith, Bert Bacharach. And of course, as everyone knows, he's, he's one of written the most everything <laughs> recorded ever. Hardest of time. Every yeah. song you know was written by Burt Bacharach. In our next number, Appalachia Waltz, you'll hear a very typical American sound coming from a region that embodies America. But it's not only North Americans that produce American sounding music. Following Appalachia Waltz, we will play Five Postcards, which is written for us by Belize born British composer Erilyn Wallen. She is a celebrated composer of contemporary classical music, but also of pop songs. The duo was written for us in 2009. In that piece, you will hear the influence of fiddle, blues, and spirituals. So here is uh, Appalachia Waltz by Mark O'Connor to start off with.
So that was Mark O'Connor, Appalachia Waltz. We have an argument, because I say Appalachia Waltz. I say Appalachia, you so, say potato. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, we always have an argument about it, and she always wins. So of course. That's just how it is. As um, it should be. As it should be. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so the next piece that we're going to play um, is by Erilyn Wallen. Um, it's the first movement of the five postcards piece that she wrote for us. Again, that was Erilyn Wallen, first movement from the five postcards. And we actually recorded the Erilyn On Wallen. our first CD. So, yeah. yeah. George Gershwin is another American composer that most of you might recognize. He's a widely recognized genius who, like Wallen, left his mark equally in both the classical and pop world. So he's probably best known, Gershwin's best known, for um, Rhapsody in Blue and uh, his opera Porgy and Bess, of course. Right now, we're going to play Gershwin's Embraceable You, paired with Ooh. another movement of five postcards, one that I made Erilyn write based on her pop song, Off the Map, which is one of my favorite songs of hers. In this song, you'll be able to hear the influence of Gershwin on her compositional style. So here's Gershwin's Embraceable You.
was Embraceable You by George Gershwin, and that was an arrangement by Paul Chihara. And now we're moving on to the second and third movements of Erlen Wallen's Five Postcards. And the second movement that we'll be playing is possibly the shortest movement you will ever hear. It's so short, we don't charge for it on iTunes. <laughs> That was the second movement. <laughs> 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 Worth every penny. All right, and now the third movement. <laughs> second and third movements, second short movement, and third movements of Erlen Wallen's Five Postcards. The connection between Gershwin and Wallen is not just based on the fact that she was heavily influenced by his music, as you probably just heard. Although Erlen was born in Belize at a young age, her family went to the U.S. and settled in Brooklyn, New York, and the Gershwins happened to also have lived in Brooklyn, New York. Like Gershwin, she blurs the line between classical music and pop music, and like Gershwin, she writes operas. So um, since it's basically summertime outside, um, and since we skipped spring, um, we thought that we would bring you Gershwin's Summertime. Nice. Um, yeah, because also we've been talking about Porgy and Bess. So we're going to do that, and we're also going to do that paired with the last two movements from Wallen's Five Postcards.
Nice. Do you feel how hot it is? <laughs> nice. Yeah, well, It's going to be yeah. warm today. It's hot in here. <laughs> and now on to the fourth and fifth movements of uh, Gershwin Five, uh, Gershwin, Wallen's Five Plus Go. was from Wallen's Five Postcards. So and that's why you can't thing. have a tall guy in this yeah, studio. Exactly, that's right. Standing up tall guy. So the last thing we're going to play for you before we talk a little bit is a piece by Franz Schubert. Now, Franz Schubert was one of the most prolific composers of the 19th century in that he actually wrote over 600 songs. He wrote a lot of symphonies. He wrote a lot of piano works um, and chamber music, but he also wrote a lot of songs for voice and piano. And this is one of the most famous of them. Um, it's been done in a lot of settings, um, both in its original vocal and piano, but also in instrumental ways. We found a version for violin and viola. It's called the Earl Koenig, Earl Koenig or Earl King, and it's kind of a legend um, after a poem by Goethe, who was a 19th century German poet. And it's about a father riding with his son through a storm on horseback. And you'll hear the clip-clop of the horses in our playing. 
You'll hear the father's voice, you'll hear the son's voice, but you'll also hear the voice of the boogeyman or the arrow caning who is after the son to basically leave this realm and join him, the Earl, Earl King, in his evil little realm. So you have got basically three voices and galloping going on here. We find it's a very dramatic song. And then the end? And in the end, ultimately, they reach their destination, but in his arms, the child is dead. something light. <laughs> Not nice. depressing at all. Nice. You guys want to come over and yeah, have, you have more? Absolutely. Or? Please. While they're coming over, I just want to remind you all that summer is upon us and we have wonderful things coming up. Music in the Meadow is on June 3rd and the Blues and Brews Fest is down at the Hygienic on June 2nd and 3rd and it will be on the main stage at the Hygienic Art Park including other venues all along up and down Bank Street throughout the city of New London. So go and check that out on Blues and Brews.
fest.com. You can check that out. And just remember to support local music. It's so important. I'm going to turn my chair around and talk to these exciting people. Hi, guys. Hi. Hello. Welcome to Grandma's Attic. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Oh, my gosh. What exciting music you play for us. <laughs> Thanks. So let's talk a little bit about you. Um, Anton, when did you first, are you having, are you all I set then? You all set? I think so. When we'll did see. you first start playing music? My goodness. Okay, so um, I grew up in a musical household. So okay. um, my dad was a singer. Um, okay. And my mom played a little bit of violin. So when I was four years old, I don't really remember this, but okay. when I was four years old, they stuck a violin underneath my chin. And I'll get this on. Um, but then they, they stuck a, uh, a violin underneath my chin, and then I remember, like when I was five, those are sort of my first memories, yep. was actually like playing the violin. And I, I remember liking it, I also remember being very frustrated with it, because mm -hmm. it just seemed like it was really difficult, but also when I could play it and when it was good, it was really exciting. So. Nice. What about you, Rita? When did you start playing? I also started young. Um, I do remember this. I don't come from a musical family. <laughs> okay. I come from a restaurant family, so I'm obsessed nice. with food, actually. That's a good thing to be it obsessed is. with. It is. Food or music. I mean, one yeah, or the yeah. other, or both, right? Um, they go together so well. Exactly. <laughs> so I remember being in my dad's restaurant after school. I was five. It must have been after kindergarten. And on the TV came this orchestra. It was a video or a film of an orchestra. And my mom was sitting there with me, and she said, how would you like to do that? And I was like, all right. Of course, little did I know, she had already signed me up for lessons, because the very next day, I was whisked off. <laughs> To start violin lessons. So what if I had said no? It would have ended badly. I don't know. Yeah, that, would have not have, that would not have been a good <laughs> thing. So you both grew up playing. You're now playing not a violin, but a viola. Right? Yes. Um, when did you change from I, one to the um, other? A very typical story. It was peer pressure. I was in junior high, and all my friends were <laughs> doing it, literally changing to the viola. And I had been playing violin at that point probably for eight years. Mm -hmm. And I, I realized I actually liked the supporting roles and not, I like playing a melody. I love a good melody, who doesn't? Right. But I liked playing the supporting roles better. So I found it more interesting to play the inner line. So I started playing um, viola in a string quartet mm -hmm. at age 12 or 13. And then I switched in college. I, my first year of college was on the viola. Right. Well, see, the, the thing is that for violinists, mm -hmm. what we really covet is the lower string that the viola has. So we get all the high stuff, and we right. can play, but we can't go as low. And sometimes, you know, the viola I can, can sound low. like like a cello. It can well, sound I was like the, just the, the lower say, registers. I hear that from cello players yeah. all the time. I hear yeah. that that they went from the violin to the cello because of the lower the registers. The lower registers, right? The, so that's the, the one thing that I'm really jealous about. The only thing. I don't think so. I think that you would be jealous if there was another person involved. Well, there might be true. When did you guys meet? Well, okay. So we actually went to school together many, 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 many years ago. Um, and then we re-met in uh, the mid-2000s. So we were in New York doing a summer festival, and mm -hmm. we, we re-met there. Um, I remembered her from school. She was, I think, 16 at the time when I first <laughs> met her. So I remember that she was a little kid. Um, but then when we played together in the mid 2000s, we really loved it. Like it was great. So then we, we sought all the opportunities to play together. We tried to find things to do. And soon after that, we formed our, our duo mm -hmm. because we just felt like there was such a synergy in what we do. There, there's definitely a synergy and, and a passion in what you two do. When did you decide that you needed to be a couple? Ah. <laughs> you, knew that, you knew that question yeah. was coming. Or in case people didn't know, we are right. married. <laughs> yeah. This is a married couple. So a in case you all didn't, yeah. didn't get it. It was a Beethoven string quartet, and I was looking over I at her. And the, no, it wasn't quite like that. It just happened. It just happened. It was one of those funny things where it's like we had such a common purpose and, and th so much in common. Um, but we also weren't living in the same places. So mm -hmm. um, there was a long time when Rita was down in Texas and mm -hmm. I was up in New York. So we only got to see each other, you know, maybe four or five times a year for different performances and things. So it wasn't really sort of logistically possible for us to kind of see each other. Um, we just got married in 2014 and... Oh no, don't tell us. <laughs> okay, this is embarrassing. We must be the only couple, luckily, where both of us constantly forget our anniversary. I mean, constantly. And yesterday... We just, we, it just passed. It passed. It was last week and we realized it yesterday. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Four, more years. Four years. That's right. <laughs> that's wonderful. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. So we're fairly new. So it was marriage. it was musical passion at first note. That's right. That's right. 
Yeah. And do you believe that the musical passion is the cement that holds you two together? No, actually, I think that's that was what brought us together. Okay. But I think it's it's much deeper and much stronger than that. But I think it also comes out in our music. It so, really does. Um, and, I, I, and I think even if we hadn't had, I mean, music brought us together. But I think even if we hadn't had music, we have similar, you know, passions for things. We like to do all the sort of activities that we like to do are very mm -hmm. similar. We and, love being and outdoors. What are some, right. And, and what are some that. of those activities that you guys do besides play music? Because Obviously, you practice for hours at a time. That's <laughs> obvious. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. this is an instrument right. that demands yes. right. that you do lots of practicing and that you stay on top of it, or your fingers will not be as nimble as they are for what you do. What other things do you do to keep each other interested? I have I have one to start with. I mean, there's there's all the outdoor activities, but when we go over, sometimes you know, if we're traveling sometimes for, for fun, vacation, but mostly for playing something. And usually mm -hmm. the first day we don't have anything if we go over to Europe or something. Um, so we go over and both of us, if it's a red eye flight, we get there at you know nine o'clock in the morning, both of us don't want to go to bed. We want to go out, we go to all the museums and we do like nice. all the kind of cultural things. And we're yeah. sort of half dead we're and museum, we don't care. We're museum junkies actually. We, we I go to like every that. single museum we can possibly go to. So. so if you have time when you come into town tomorrow, you should check out some of the galleries downtown because oh, New right. London has some really interesting stuff. This is the Whaling City and yeah, it's got right. some really cool, cool. historically mm -hmm. historically right. cool stuff. So just in case you're interested and my audience needs to know all that stuff. That's anyway, great. so let's talk a little bit about um, your travels. You have been around the world and you have played for some pretty incredible audiences. Um, not only the Eastern Connecticut Symphony Orchestra, which is probably my favorite orchestra in the whole world. It's a wonderful orchestra. It's a great, it really Toshi is. does such a Toshi good job. We yeah. love Toshi. He's a, he, yeah, and Caleb has taken over and is doing really great yep. things. Yep, absolutely. He's just um, full of passion for the music. Yeah, so, I would definitely uh, send a plug out for the for Eastern the, Connecticut, Eastern Connecticut. Absolutely. absolutely. I talk about him as often as organization. Awesome. A yeah. local I can. gem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what we call oh, them. Yeah, absolutely. Our local gem. They're absolutely fabulous. And they're doing things in the community even on the off season. It's not right. the season now, but there's all kinds of things going on. And people can go to Eastern Connecticut Symphony Orchestra dot org to find out more about what's going on with them and they're doing fabulous yep. things. Yep. What other places have you played? What other symphonies have you played with that would interest my audience? Let's see, we've been down to, um, you know, on the East Coast, we've been um, down to Baltimore and mm -hmm. played with several um, organizations down there. We've played um, other, other orchestras in Connecticut, smaller orchestras mm -hmm. that we played in Connecticut. We're just about to go down to New Mexico. We leave tomorrow to go down to New Mexico. Nice. For, yeah. uh, a little residency down there. Um, and we just got back from, what did we do? We were in um, Rhode Island for a couple of concerts. And then we, we were, were in Nebraska. We played in Nebraska. And oh, yeah. We played in Mexico. And we did, nice. I think, our first, one of our first Mozart Symphonia Contratantes, which is uh -huh. the piece that most people, if they play violin and viola together, will play, is that piece. And it was one of our first times. We do that several times a year. And I think one of our first ones was in Mexico. Nice. So yeah, that was nice. It was beautiful. And then we're going to be in Iceland in Israel. about a month. Israel. Yeah. yeah. This wow. year we were in Taiwan for three, two weeks. How yeah, is that? Weeks. Taiwan yeah. is great. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, it's, a trip, it's a long trip, though. <laughs> it's the a culture, long trip. It's a long trip. And the culture is, is very different. It is a lot different. Do yeah. you see that in music, too, though? Do you see? that musicians culturally are different in the way they respond to each other in different countries? There's, there's a different background. Uh, you know, music has, especially for classical music, there are different kinds of schools of teaching. Mm -hmm. So what we see is um, when, when we work with younger people, what we kind of try to do is take a sort of more global approach. So we kind of let people know kind of what is out there and what people are doing. Okay. Um, so it depends on, you know, the country. It depends on, you know, the, the sort of teachers that they've had and a kind of, you know, that, in that way, the culture. Um, when I was in Vietnam, for example, most of the teachers were from Moscow or from Russia. And so there was a different kind of way of teaching and a different kind of way of talking about music, a different language that, that they sort of speak musically. Um, but in general, 
we sort of all have the same ideas. We play the same repertoire a lot Emotionally, of Emotionally, and I think this is not just classical music in various places in the world. I think all musicians, I think we're all about the same. I think I we think have the same concerns. You know, we behave, we're much younger than our years most of the time because we get a lot of youth and vitality from playing our instruments or singing or whatever Absolutely. we do. Absolutely. So I think like emotionally or psychologically, a lot of us are very similar. And I think, yeah, there's a different, there's schools of training, you know, but music is music, so. And, well, absolutely. And I was speaking with someone um, actually on Facebook the other day about, they said that math was the universal language. And I said, absolutely not. I know that without math, you can't play music, but music is the universal right. language that everybody can relate to. And I find that instrumental music more um, more in the forefront is what really people get attracted to. Yeah. Not so much words, right. but, the, but the instruments and what goes on with them. So you guys are teachers of music. Uh -huh. Where are you teaching now? We, teach, we both teach at the Hart School, which mm -hmm. is part of the University of Hartford, so we're on faculty there. And, uh, and then we just go around, you know, various places in the world to give residencies, which in the summer it actually gets very busy, so yeah. we're about to start all of that. And actually, next, well, after New Mexico, which is this weekend. Right. And then right after that, we're going straight to Rhode Island, which is nearby. Right. And there's a music festival there called Music, music on, on the Hill. It's musiconthehillri.org. Nice. And um, they have, I think, eight, seven or eight concerts uh -huh. from, I think it's June 1st or 2nd through the 9th in Rhode Island, various places. Right. So nice. yeah, so we'll be there. It's always fun. So where can people go to find out more about that again? That's musiconthehillri.org. Yeah. Dot org. Okay, yeah. great. Now let's talk about some of these um, CDs. This is, um, can you get a shot of these? Where, where do you want me to put this? Is this good? Okay, so this is the first one. Let me tip it a little bit. This is the first one? That's right. And it's called Five Postcards, and you played some pieces from this. The Wallen that we played? All, the the entire track. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> it's on that CD. Okay. All right. So this is the first one. And that's a and CD that has lots of its uh, compositions, um, mainly of... Uh, the Americas. Composers of the Americas. So it's okay. music that was written for us, a lot of it. All right. I personally haven't heard it yet because it's not the one that you guys gave me to play. So now you have it. I do. So now you're going to hear it. I, and so will all of my listening <laughs> audience That's great. on WCNI 90.9 <laughs> FM. Let me get a plug in yeah, for there that. You go. Here's the second one. Tell us a little bit about eight pieces. Yep. There, there we go. Uh -huh. <laughs> eight pieces has only two works on it, and both of them happen to be called eight pieces. So actually, it's 16 pieces. Nice. But, you know, that doesn't make any sense. So it's eight pieces. <laughs> Makes and, a lot of sense. Yeah. And um, it's a work by Max Brook, who was a romantic composer who lived mainly in the 19th century. Um, his music is looking backwards very much. And then the other piece is a piece that I transcribed for violin and viola from violin and cello. Okay. Because, you know, cello, viola. Eh. Yep. And, uh, They're a little clear. different. A They're little, a little bit different. Lot. Size is a little different. Size is a lot different. But yes. I'm more but portable. Yeah, yes, you are. <laughs> now, I have to tell you that I have played this particular CD. Do we have it? Where am I? There we go. On my radio show, countless times I've played pieces off from it, and I've played it from start to finish about four times now. Oh, that's great. I love this CD. I love what it brings to um, my listening audience, and I love listening to the passion that you guys play with. Where did this come from and, and why did you do this particular CD? That one was composers or related to composers that had to leave because of conflict. Okay. So um, it's got music by Robert Fuchs, Ernest Toch, and Martineau. And Ernst Toch was a German composer of Jewish background who had to leave in the 30s, had to leave Germany and, and move to America, mm -hmm. where a lot of composers of that generation who were leaving Europe because of that um, got work in Hollywood. So he actually ended up composing for silent film, which is another one of our passions. We actually accompany several shows of silent films. Nice. Yeah, that's fun. That must be that's a really blast. Cool. Yeah. So actually, that, that came about because we were trying to promote our film stuff. And you know, we put these pieces together. And Robert Fuchs actually was the teacher of talk. 
And he also taught Mahler and Zemlinsky and all those guys, I like the Mahler. ultra romantic, you know, the end of the turn of the century, um, end of the century, turn of the century. And Martin knew it was, it was a similar situation. He was, he as we mentioned, also. he had to leave because of the Nazis. He got branded as a, uh, you know, as a problem. <laughs> as a problem. As a yeah. problem. Yeah, right, and, right. Um, and left. And he did end up in U.S. for a little while um, but, and taught Bert Bacharach. But he ended up moving back to Switzerland, I but, think, in yeah. Czechoslovakia. But, the, but the, the, the main reason that we you know, put all of those pieces together, there's a common thread and a common theme, but we also really love those pieces, and we really love playing them. And they're so not played that much, actually, and they're not recorded in their entirety. At least the Fuchs and the talk are not recorded from anyone else in their entirety. They are now. <laughs> they are. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Not only are they played, they are reported to zone reporting, too. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> get you guys on the zone reporting thing. Yeah. That's wonderful. Do you have another CD in the works at any yeah. point? We yeah. do. We have one that's half recorded, and we have to... We've been so busy this year traveling and touring. When but should I be looking for that to come out? Do you well, know? If we say, then we can set a deadline. That's yeah, true. That works. That's right. <laughs> well, what we usually do is we, we spend our Januaries is when we've been recording in the past. And then by the time we do you know all of the production, it, it normally comes out then the in the fall. fall. Yeah. So um, probably next fall, maybe. It, the, what we're hoping. The only thing is that we've been now to, and we're going back again to Taiwan, Nice. In January, so it's like that's the time when we normally would record. So right. we've been traveling during that time. We'll so finding out. finding the time to do it, but I think I think maybe we'll do that. Yeah. And, and you'll we'll, let and we'll, me know. And we'll come we'll on and we'll tell. Yeah, we'll yeah, tell you about it. You exactly. Yeah. You'll be the first we'll, to know. We'll now, where can people find your music? Excuse me. Where can people find your music? Um, the usual I'd places. Like yeah, Spotify. You know, um, Amazon, um, okay. iTunes, iTunes, uh, CD Baby. Pretty much. If you Google our name, they'll, they'll come up on how to buy it. But it's usually pretty much all the normal places you would buy okay, music. Okay, so they would um, Google Miller Porfer Porphyrus Duo. I have such a hard time with you. You did a good That's great. Um, Miller Porphyrus Duo, and your stuff will pop right up no um, matter yeah. what. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it will. It yeah. should. It yeah. should. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you had the chance to teach any group of people one thing and one thing only what would you teach them each of you can give a different answer or would it be the same thing well now are we talking about skills or are we talking about there's so many possibilities i think what i would want to teach everyone is how to get along like to okay. me that's that's sort of for me that's that's music right music is all about you know presenting to people and and communicating with people and okay. making sure that people understand each other all right that's awesome and that's wonderful. We're running out of time. This happens to me every interview. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming Thank to Grandma's Attic. Will you take us out with a song? Sure. Yep. Please make sure you undo your thing. So. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to Grandma's Attic Music Review. We're going to let these two, Anton and Rita, take us out. They're wonderful. They've been a great, great addition to Grandma's Attic portfolio. We're so glad to have them here, and we're so glad that you tune in every week. Thank you so much. You can find us on Facebook under Grandma's Attic Music Review if you want to leave a message or ask us what's going on. Check it out. And we're also up on YouTube, Grandma's Attic Music Review on YouTube. Check it out. We'd love to have you join us. We'd love to have you know more about us. Pass the word if you want. Until next week, everybody, bye-bye and God bless. You're going to recognize this one. Okay. <laughs>